A very good morning to all of you here at our second service here on site uh, and those online. Welcome. Thank you for coming early. Would you rise to your feet right now as I prepare us uh, to praise God with songs of worship. Father, we give thanks this morning that we can gather as your people, as sons and daughters, coming before a great King, a great God who chooses to dwell with His people. And for that, we are eternally grateful. And so, Lord, as we come before Your presence this morning, we want to acknowledge that You are always here, every time and everywhere in our lives. But especially now, this morning, we want to give praises to You for who You are to us and to Your church. So Lord, would you remove every distraction in our midst. May you help us to center down on you this morning. We give you praise and honour in Jesus' name. Amen.
you come before him and just praise him this morning. He deserves your all. Let's declare this. Who else would rock cry out to worship? Whose glory taught the stars to shine?
we join with all creation to praise his holy name. And this is what Psalms 148 declares. The kings of the earth and all peoples, princes and all rulers of the earth, young men and maidens together, all the old men and children, let them praise the name of the Lord. For his name alone is exalted, his majesty above earth and heaven. Amen. We praise you, Lord. Let them praise him. Oh, let them praise him. Praise his name. Praise his name. Let's declare, church. Praise him.
your only creation that was made in your image, O oh Lord. We want to give you all of our lives. But yet sometimes what we face in our circumstances hold us back. The things that we are personally waiting upon you, Lord. We come this morning and surrender all our broken dreams, our brokenness, our barrenness, our wilderness, our pain, our guilt, even our regret. And we ask you, Lord, as we surrender it before you, will you do your work in our lives? Give us grace to cling on. Church, we just spend a few minutes right now in a divine exchange. Just tell it to the Lord. Just surrender before Him. Everything that holds us back.
We need your touch, oh Lord.
let us adore him. reigning forever and ever and ever. This morning we are reminded from your scriptures in Revelation 21, 3 to 4, where it says, And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with men. He will dwell with them and they will be His people. And God Himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. And death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore. For the former things have passed away. And so God, as we come before You as Your children, every week, every Sunday, you remind us through our declaration of praises to you of the hope that is firm and secure, not in the things of the world, but in the very truth of your word, that you will return and indeed you will dwell with us for all eternity. And to the day comes when Jesus returns, we hope We wait expectantly. We prepare ourselves to meet King Jesus right now, right here. So Lord, would you prepare our hearts this morning as we get ready to receive your word. May your word fall on good soil this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Before you take your seat, would you turn to someone next to you and say, God loves you. God loves you. For those watching online, God loves you as well. Good morning, welcome to Covenant EFC, our second service here at Woodland Centre. Welcome to those online as well, on behalf of our senior pastors, Reverend Tan Kei Kyung and Reverend Tony Yo. This morning, we'd like to welcome yet a very special group of people, and those who are, uh, they are those who are new in our midst, both online and on-site. Now, for those of you who are on-site, if you have brought a friend or if you are new with us this morning, could you kindly wave to us so that we can welcome you and give you a welcome pack? So is there anywhere one this morning? Yes, welcome. Good morning. Lovely wave. Lovely wave. Good morning. Good morning. Anyone else in our midst? Well, good morning. Thank you. Uh, every week we have more than one. Many newcomers, but they're often very shy um, to raise their hand. That's fine. Uh, I'll catch you at the escalator nonetheless. Uh, but good morning. I'd love to connect with you after the service to just get to know you. Uh, so don't run off after the service. But for, th- for those of you who are here today, on site and online, on the screen you will see a service bulletin. And the service bulletin will contain all the information of our church life uh, and also our service sermon outline for this morning. So you can scan the QR code and then we will carry on with our worship. Wonderful. Let's carry on with the time of worship through our giving this morning. And this morning, we have the privilege to give firstly to our general fund um, where we will deal with how we um, bless our church and and, and the ones surrounding our nations um, with the general funds of our workers and also our expenses of our building. So you can use your bank app and scan on the QR code. For those of you who also want to give to the missions fund, you can scan this QR code and in the remarks section, type in M. F. So I'll give you a few more moments before we move on to the other QR code. Wonderful. The next QR code, it's a giving for our New Life Community Services. 
Um, and so you can, skew, you can scan the QR code if God leads you to give to our New Life community service. And for those of you who don't know, this is our social services arm. And in the recent months, God has blessed New Life uh, with the recent work in Bukit Panjang where they're going to build an a, a, a sen- a active aging centre next to our Bukit Panjang centre. Uh, and with the new development with our childcare services, with the expansion of the work happening uh, for a new life. So would you give as the Lord leads you um, this morning? For those of you who want to give physically as well, you can do so after the service at the front of our stage over here. If not, let me pray for us. Father, we give thanks once more for all that you have given to us. And we acknowledge and we recognize that everything we have truly belongs to you and that we are called to merely be stewards of the resources. So Lord, as we give unto you whatever that you have led us this morning, will you use that? Multiply it so that many more will come to know you and make you known. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. This morning, we have a very special um, time where we're going to get our board to come to dedicate themselves and as our congregation to affirm them. So would you welcome our senior pastors and the church board this morning. Good morning, church. Good morning. Let me try that again. Good morning, church. Good morning. And also those of you online and those of you at the East Centre, as well as those of you at Bukit Panjang Centre. We are living indeed in a time of great chaos and uncertainty in the world. And God has chosen to raise the church of Jesus Christ to be the beacon of hope and light in our nation and in this world. We're grateful to God uh, two weeks ago, on the 13th of April, 2024, uh, the church members gathered for our annual general meeting. And we are grateful for 491 constitutional members who were gathered to approve key decisions that we made together as a spiritual family so as to poise covenant to answer God's call and purposes for covenant EFC. Many four areas, firstly, some uh, uh, changes to our church constitution so that we stay relevant to the times in which we live in. Number two, we uh, prove God's abund- we celebrate God's abundant provision for our church, especially in the stewardship of uh, property and land that God has given to Covenant EFC over the years. Uh, in a land scarce Singapore, every land is God's gift to us for us to steward wisely and faithfully and also responsibly. And we are grateful here in Woodland Centre by 20, uh, uh, 2022, we completed all our alteration and addition for this Woodland Centre so that we can welcome more children and young families into these uh, facilities. And then we also approve and agree on um, what God will do in Sengkang land, the home that God has prepared for uh, Covenant East Centre uh, in the next few years to build a, a centre, a Sengkang a centre at Sengkang for East Centre. And finally, also uh, for Bukit Panjang Centre, in the light of the lease renewal that is due by December 2027, we approve for us to proceed with that and also at the same time to do a A and A on Bukit Panjang Centre that will be 30 years old by 2027. And we are so thankful for God's provision for all this uh, facility and property needs uh, that God has entrusted to us. Thirdly, we are reminded of God's presence with us as a spiritual family in covenant to lead us as we continue to build an intentional disciple-making church in discipling generations, Singapore and the nations. And finally, we also had an election of uh, new board members for the year 2024 onwards. And we are so blessed here in Covenant FC to have men and women of God with different competency and gifts and experiences to serve in the church board and to help us in the area of overseeing proper and wise and godly governance of our church. 
And so we come to this time where we want to present to you and to lead in the board dedication of our new board members in Covenant EFC. So I bring before you this morning uh, on, on, uh, online as well, our new board members of Covenant EFC. I want to bring before you uh, a charge to the church board right now. Dear board members, in the presence of God and this congregation, do you as the church board and council of elders of Covenant EFC commit yourself faithfully and wholeheartedly to diligently discharge your duties and your responsibilities? In God's presence, we will. As the church board and council of elders of Covenant Evangelical Free Church, we acknowledge that this is a sacred trust given by God and a delegated authority from the congregation. By God's grace, we will humbly seek the mind of God to lead and labor together, acknowledging each other's spiritual gifts and appreciating each other's vital contribution. Our primary intent is to fulfill God's agenda for this church. We will endeavor by God's grace to be overseers of church governance, guardians of church policies, projectors of church vision, protectors of church doctrines, stewards of church resources, and executors of church discipline. Above all, we seek to be examples of authentic discipleship and models of intentional disciple-makers. We will heed God's word in Acts 20:28 20, to pay careful attention to ourselves and to all the flock in which the Holy Spirit has made us overseer to care for the church of God which he obtained with his own blood. So help us, God. Right now, we're right now testing. We'd like now to request all the constitutional members of Covenant EFC, would you please arise? Will you, the members of Covenant EFC, receive this Council of Elders and Church Board and do all in your power to make their appointment under God a blessing to this community and the church? In God's presence, we will. We entrust the leadership of this church to you, knowing that you have been selected by God for such a time as this. We pray that you will discharge your duties, roles, and responsibilities in the fear of God and to the best of your gifts and abilities. We commit to praying for you, giving to you the double honor that you deserve. We endeavor to support your collective decision that will seek to establish and advance the kingdom of God. Shall we all pray together? Our Heavenly Father, thank you for the privilege of serving you as board members in Covenant EFC. Together with all the lay leaders in this church, keep us in your love, keep us faithful, keep us joyous always. Protect us with godly integrity and credibility. Preserve our unity in diversity. Deploy us to serve you with Christ-like humility and authority. Let Covenant EFC be the church you call her to be. Governize us as a church to fulfill your mandate and mission to be your hands and feet. O oh Lord, remove any barriers and open every door to proclaim the gospel. Let the Holy Spirit empower us to become your authentic disciples and intentional disciple makers of a certain kind. We pray all this in Jesus' most precious name. Amen. Please be seated. Thank you. We thank God for the good series uh, for the last couple of weeks. We started with uh, issue of loneliness, and then we move on to the issue of sexuality. Today we are talking about mental wellness. Please welcome Pastor Chung Kai.
This morning, I'm so glad that we had a chance to see our new church board. Uh, many of you see the pastors more than you see the church board members because they are members among you. So we don't recognize them. But I think once a year, at least we get to see them. And whether you're in Bukit Panjang Woodlands or you're at East Centre, uh, please, uh, when you see them, just go up to them and shake their hands because they do incredible amount of work and energy in praying that we will align to God. So uh, we really thank God for our church board members. Today is the 21st of April. I'd like to bring you about a month ahead to the 15th of May, 2024. Obviously, it hasn't happened yet. Huh? But 15th of May, 2024 is an important date for Singaporeans. Do you know why it's important? Ah, very good. This whole week, isn't it? We are plastered in the news. Our fourth prime minister will be installed in office on the 15th of May, 2024, from DPM Lawrence Wong to uh, PM Lawrence Wong on the 15th of May uh, this year. It's an important transition for Singaporeans. But I like to uh, not fast forward us because it hasn't happened yet. I like to move us two months down the road back to 7th of February 2024, where DPM Lawrence Wong also made an important statement in Parliament. And this is what he said. Allow me to read to us. It says mental health has grown in importance both in Singapore and across the world. In the past, people dealt with mental health issues privately. It was always in the shadows, not something we talk about publicly. In recent times, attitudes have shifted for the better. People are more informed about mental health and are more willing to talk about this openly. It is so important, basically, what he has done is, in Parliament, said the national agenda for Singapore, one of the key priorities is mental health issues. And this morning, that's exactly what we're going to look at. So before we carry on, invite us to close our eyes, bow our heads. We're going to invite God here. I and mean, God has been present. We're just acknowledging Him right now. So would you do that? Let's take a few moments. Quarten our hearts. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for being here with us. As the psalmist says in Psalm 85, let me hear what God the Lord will speak. He will speak peace to His people, to His saints. Likewise, this morning, as your children gather, we ask that we may hear your Holy Spirit speaking to us. Peace be with you. Let your shalom rest over your children. Let your shalom rest over our families. Let your shalom rest over our nation. Let your shalom rest over our troubled worlds. Still our hearts to hear your voice, our Heavenly Father this day, speaking peace be to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Good morning and welcome to Covenant's Pulpit. Uh, we are preaching through the book of Leviticus this year, but we've taken a break, a hiatus, post-Easter, to cover some current issues. And so if on the screen we could show what those uh, things we've been doing. Over the last uh, two weeks, uh, Pastor Sharon brought to us the whole idea of loneliness and how we can build community. Last Sunday, we heard Dr. Ng Liang Wei speak about gender and sexuality. Uh, next week, we'll look at this whole idea of uh, pursuit of purpose in a materialistic world. And then the last Sunday, on the 5th of May, we'll talk about identity crisis in a digital age. But as Pastor Kei Kiong, our senior pastor, shared with us, this morning, we're looking at this whole area of mental health issues and how we can embrace wholeness. Now, this business of mental health is certainly very broad. How, how on earth do we tackle it? So let me give you a quick context. I, I want to frame it in three myths. Three myths. Huh? What are these myths? The first myth is that our mental health issue is mainly just about the mind. And while it does concern the mind, that's why it's called mental health issues, I want to present to you that it's more than just about the mind. It involves our feelings, our relationships, our psychological, our biochemical situation, our whole body, our whole lives, our relationship. It, it affects our mental health. So while it's talk about mental health, it's more than that. So I give you an example. Let's say you have a medical condition, you're, you're ill, or for example, you had a stroke. A young person, you had a stroke. Certainly, that, it's physically affecting you, you're hemiplegic, you cannot move, you cannot carry on the work that you've been doing in the past. You, you can no longer earn a living for your family, isn't it? That will certainly affect you mentally, right? So physical affect that. Or for example, if you have a loved one, and for whatever reason, suddenly the person passed away, and you're in deep grief. Most, all of us would grieve, passing of a loved one. But if your grief is so deep, you're unable to get out of it, you may enter into the darkness of depression and get stuck there. So something that is uh, a circumstantial, something that is external, but emotionally has affected you, has led you mentally to be affected. I shared it with us so that when we talk about mental health, we recognize it's more than just about the mind. It's, it's a whole complex mix of matters. That's number one. The, the second myth that we have is that mental health is not so common. Lah. 
Obviously, this is not true huh? because the whole of Singapore resources is, are putting into that as one of our major priorities. Singapore recognizes mental health is a major issue. As a matter of fact, worldwide, worldwide, common mental health disorders affect one in five adults. One in five adults. So just now, our senior pastors asked, those of you who are constitutional members, could you stand? Huh? So you had a look. What if in a congregation like this or online, we count off one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five, we went through these whole things and say, number five, stand up. One in five, 20%. This is the state of affairs of adults who suffer from common mental disorders. That's really quite a bit. As a matter of fact, a survey done in our National Population Health Survey two years ago, 2022, finds that the highest proportion of mental stress, mental health issues, you know, come from which age group? It's the young adults, 19 to 29 years old. 25%, so many young adults here, uh, one in four of you suffer from mental health issues. As a matter of fact, this week, uh, my mental health uh, took a beating because I had to prepare for this message. <laughs> I'm joking. <laughs> you know, we all deal with stress, isn't it? That's the reality. We all face certain pressures in life. And, and that's the reality of how, this, how, how do we look at it? I bring this up because when we think that it's uncommon and some Christians, we think all mental health issues are spiritual issues. Meaning this, you say, well, you look at the Gennesaret demonic. Uh, when Jesus was there, he delivered this man out of legion and it says in the scriptures, he became in his right mind. There, you see, mental health is caused by demonic spiritual factors. Just because that one incident happened doesn't mean all incidences, all situations have to do with spiritual matters. I do not deny some required deliverance. On the other hand, there are Christians who say, no, this, these things don't exist. Everything has to do with just your mental willpower. You know, this whole sense that you just got to uh, suck it up. You just got to be stoic, you know. Snap out of it! You know, when people are in depression and you tell them to snap out of it, it's the worst thing. It's the most cruel thing you can say to them because biochemical changes in their, in their, it's affecting them. They cannot snap out of it. So listen to what I'm saying. Mental health issues is complex. There are biochemical factors, there are spiritual factors, and there are also discipleship issues that we have to deal with. It is complex. We need to deal with each one appropriately. Mental health issues is not just common. It is complex. And the third myth is this. Christians don't have mental health problems. Why? Because we got Jesus. Jesus solves every problem in this world. We, we, are, we go through life with no troubles at all. If that's what you think, um, I'm not sure what Bible you're reading. Lah. You cannot go far into the scriptures without recognizing that the best suffer from challenges and they respond appropriately as well. So for example, in the Psalms here, King David, King David himself, this is what he cries out, my soul is also greatly troubled, but you, O Lord, how long? I am weary from morning, from morning. Every night I flood my bed with tears. Can you imagine? It is, it is crying so much so that you feel like you're sleeping in your tears. I drench my couch with my weeping. My eyes waste away because of grief. This really sounds like someone in deep, deep depression. It grows weak because of my falls. Psalm 13, he says, How long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I take counsel in my soul and have sorrow in my heart? There is a deep pain, there is a burden he can't get rid of. This is King David speaking, the best of us. And if you think it's only King David, Psalm 42, written by the sons of Korah, he says, Why are you downcast, O my soul? Why are you in turmoil within me? So what we talk about as mental health issues, the challenges we face, it's common as human beings we face it. As a matter of fact, even our Lord Jesus himself struggled with this. Many of you will find it hard to believe. Turn, I'm going to show you on, on the text now in Matthew chapter 26. Look at what it says. And taking with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, he began to be sorrowful and troubled. Oh. And he said to them, my soul is not just sorrowful, my soul is very sorrowful. Not just very sorrowful, even to death. Pause a moment and let that sink in, huh? Here is God incarnate in the person of his son. He came to the place in his life where he says, I feel the weight, I'm under such duress. I feel like giving up. Have you ever thought about that? 
Different ones of us, we walk through the journey differently. Some of us come to the place and say, we can't go on anymore. We can't go on anymore. I want to share with you, you're not alone. You're not alone. I share that with us to let us know that this is something that we all struggle with, the best of us struggle with. How do we as Christ followers look at something like this and achieve some measure of victory over this? And this morning, that's what we want to look at. Even if our Lord, in His struggle, He didn't give up, how did He manage to do that? So how am I going to frame this morning's uh, message? I'm going to do it this way. Now, the major mental issues, for example, like uh, major dis- depressive illnesses, endogenous, uh, bipolar disorder, schizophrenia, I-, I do not think we will move in that direction. I'm not a specialist there. It would not be wise for me to move in that direction. But there are what is called common mental issues that all of us struggle with. Fears, anxieties, uh, the stressors, the pressures we face. That's something every one of us struggle with. How are we as Christ followers achieve some measure of victory over that area. Secondly, rather than looking at just mental unwellness, what does it look like for mental wellness? What does it look like to be whole? So for example, WHO, this is the definition of mental wellness. It says mental wellness is a state of well-being in which an individual realizes his or her own abilities can cope with the normal stresses of life, can work productively and fruitfully, and is able to make a contribution to his or her community. (sighs) It's quite a mouthful, huh? It's like Covenant EFC, our mission statement, are returning the church to a disciple-making roots through authentic discipleship. (sighs) (laughs) we, we We just are tired after saying that. It's just a mouthful. Now, it needs to be comprehensive. After all, it's a WHO, right? But how do we remember that? Just as in our vision statement, we, we, we boil it down to authentic discipleship and intentional disciple making of a certain kind. Likewise, mental wellness. I boil it down for us today to one word. I think it's a good representation. And the word is wholeness. Wholeness. How can we live life with wholeness? This idea of wholeness is, to, I would say, equivalent to the Old Testament equivalent of shalom. Shalom is peace. We say shalom. But it's more than just the absence of trouble in this world. The idea of shalom is the, is the presence of something deeper, that anchoredness that through the storms of life, you and I can walk through. This morning, I present to you, how on earth can we look at this idea of embracing wholeness that God intends for us as Christ followers? Not that there'll be no trouble, but in the midst of it, how can we be whole? So let me present to you that embracing wholeness requires a few things. It requires for us to embrace the worth of a person. God's worth of a person. It it requires us to embrace God's work for a person. And finally, it requires us to embrace God's way of what it means to be a person. God's worth for a person, God's work for a person, and God's way of what it means to be a person. Let's look at the first, which is embracing God's worth for a person. I call it human doing versus human, not being, but human beloved. What do I mean? So, for example, in the Garden of Gethsemane, we've already seen Jesus was under tremendous stress. So much so that in the Gospel of Luke, in Luke's account, it says that Jesus came to the place where he was perspiring like blood drops. No, you're sweating blood. So the question some people ask, is it a real situation? So there is a real medical condition called hematidrosis, where the blood vessels burst in our sweat glands and you can actually perspire blood. But I don't think that's what the, the Gospel writer is talking about. I think he's speaking about Jesus under such tremendous pressure. He was perspiring like he was dripping blood, perspiring, just just pouring out, pouring out. How many of us have come to that place where under such stress, that's what's happening? And you and I know that, did Jesus end his life there? I sorrow unto death, then I, I, I just end. No, he didn't. He overcame. He had the resilience of heart and mind and spirit. And I, I tell you, the most amazing thing happened. You know why? You see, the battle for the cross was not won at the cross. Let me say that again. The battle for the cross was not won at the cross. It was won at Gethsemane. Gethsemane was the place where Jesus had to surrender himself, physical, social, emotional, everything, all his fears, all his burdens, surrender it to God again. And when that battle was won, he was able to go to the cross. The physical battle took place the next day. But the mental, emotional, spiritual surrender to God, that took place at Gethsemane. How did Jesus overcome? How did Jesus have that resilience to live God's will? I present to you that he did so by embracing who he was. How do we see that? 
we fast, we go back again. This morning, we keep going back. Eh? We go back, not to the end of Jesus' ministry, but the beginning of his ministry. So in the scriptures, and in Matthew chapter 3, verse 16 and 17, let me bring before you the context. It says, when Jesus was baptized, immediately he went up from the water, and behold, the heavens were opened to him. He saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove, coming to rest upon him, and behold, a voice from heaven said, this is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. Wow. We are familiar with this. Many of us, we've read through this many times. But we may not be aware of the significance of this statement here. What do I mean by that? Imagine with me if you have been silent, not for four hours, not for four days, not for four weeks, not for 40 days, not for four months, not for four years, not for 40 years, but for 400 years, you have been silent. And what we have here is something so significant, it will blow your mind. Because since the closure of the Old Testament canon to the ministry of Jesus, the prophetic voice had been silent for 400 years. People knew God had not spoken. Every literature written in that period was called intertestament literature, and no one rec everyone recognized that it, this is not inspired literature because the voice of God was silent. God has been silent for 400 years. What are the first words out of his mouth? What are the first words out of mouth of God after 400 years? The audible voice of God that people heard. You know what God said? And I will paraphrase this in the baptism of Jesus. This is what I believe God said in spirit. Look, my son, I love him. I'm so proud of him. That's what it says here. My beloved son, with him, I'm well pleased. The first words out of God's mouth after 400 years of silence. Look, my son, I love him. I'm so proud of him. Friends, this is incredible. This is incredible. The first words out of God's mouth is to confirm, affirm the identity of his son. You know, all of us long for that. You and I deeply long for that. We long to hear our parents say that to us. We long to hear God say that to us because it forms our very core, our identity. This morning, God speaks to you. You are my beloved son. You are my beloved daughter. I love you so much. I'm proud of you. I, you need to understand that. That forms the very core of who Jesus is. And friends, I share with you that this core is so important. Why? Because we live in a world that challenges that consistently. Every day, it challenges that. See, let me tell you how. How are you considered worthy today? Most of us are considered worthy. If you're a student, if, if you score, A, ah, if not A star, <laughs> A++, isn't it? You're worthy to the degree that you, you do well. Or, or in, in, in the marketplace, you, your numbers for this quarter, you better make it, you know? If not, you're going to have a conversation with your boss, isn't it? And all this affects our sense of worth. And that's the reality of the world we live in. I'm not saying, I'm not saying that for students, I don't study. Eh? I'm not saying that. By all means, do your best. But that's not the basis for your worth. That's not the basis for your worth. This is so important. Why? Because, you see, if we apply this kind of thing, eh, you're only worthy when you have accomplished the task. How would it happen for the life of Jesus? It would happen like this, you know. It would happen like this. Jesus is, what is Jesus' mission? What is Jesus' mission? What is the mission of Jesus? Die on the cross, substitutionary atonement, isn't it? That's Jesus' mission, right? That is when he finishes it. So when do you and I to expect this? We would expect this, huh, when Jesus is hanging on the cross. His final words, it is finished, tetelestai. It is finished. And he hangs his head and he's dead. And the heavens open. And a voice comes down. This is my beloved son. With him, I'm well pleased. That's the Singapore style for this. But it's totally wrong, you know. God never did that. Right at the beginning of Jesus' ministry, hardly before finishing at the cross, God says, look, my son, I love him. I'm proud of him. You see, it messes with us. It's crazy. It is crazy. It's the crazy love of God. My friends, this is your God. This is our God. The God who comes to us today and says, don't, don't, work, don't work in this direction. Don't, don't work for just your worth. 
Don't, don't let that basis be on how you understand your worth as a person. This is challenged every day. You know why? Because Jesus' very situation was challenged. So here with me, eh? here Jesus was baptized. A voice came, you are my son. I love you very much. You know what happens next? He goes into the wilderness and is tempted, right? Correct. Eh? So look at the screen, how the devil comes to tempt Jesus. So Matthew chapter 4, verse 1, on the screen it says, Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. After fasting 40 days, 40 nights, he was hungry, and the tempter came to him and said, What? If you are the Son of God, command these stones to become bread. Run your fingers down to verse 6. And the devil, and he said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down. What is challenge for Jesus? His identity. You cannot miss this, you know. The identity was affirmed, confirmed by God to everyone publicly. And immediately the identity is challenged. Oh, you think you're the son of God? Prove yourself, prove yourself. That's what we face every day. All around us, the world says, prove yourself, prove you're good enough, turn this bread into stone, do all this. Do you see that? All of us struggle with that, my friends. And because we struggle with that, if we listen to that voice and try to prove ourselves, no wonder we are stressed. No wonder we, we cannot bear up under it because our identity is insecure. Until you come to the place where you are embraced by the love of God, recognize how much He loves you fully, full stop. We will struggle consistently with this. Again, I'm not saying be lazy, good for nothing. Singaporeans, very hard to be like that. Like we are overachievers uh, by and large. We, we need to hear that afresh. This is what Minister Lawrence uh, Wong, Prime Minister, uh, VPM, Lawrence Wong said, on the same message, uh, on the 7th of February. He says, we also need to loosen up, talking to parents uh, in the real world, and give our children more space for free play and autonomy. Because when children have less room to play and explore, or to interact and build social skills at an early age, they are also less likely to grow up with a sense of independence and confidence to take charge of their own lives. I'm a parent too. I have not really... I don't want to put that pressure on my children, but unwittingly, sometimes I, I have. And unbeknowingly, many of us love, all of us love our kids, but sometimes we ex have certain expectations placed upon them, and it adds on to the pressure so much so that they struggle with that. They struggle with that. As parents, we don't want to do that. We want our children to thrive, to be whole, isn't it? But I share this with us because this, this often happens, especially in Singapore, because often our markers for success academically for our children is that they do well. And what DPM has just said is, hey, are there other markers? And I present to you today, as far as God is concerned, of course there are other markers. It has to do with what it means to be a child of God, to be embraced by the Lord. So I'm going to take a risk this morning. Some of you, you are here with your children. <sighs> Deep breath. Would, would you want to do this? Now I'll give you a few moments. If your child is here, would you just hold your child's hand? Really, just hold your child's hand. Hold hand first, one step at a time. <laughs> hold hands first. <sighs> Deep breath. And then look at your child. You're my son. You're my daughter. I really love you. I really love you. I know what many of you are thinking. He's so cringy. <laughs> uh, I know some parents told me that after the first service. Oh, so cringy. My kids don't want. Never mind, I do at home. Okay? <laughs> but do you realize uh, that for the Lord, for God, he made that statement publicly to Jesus in front of everybody. You know? This is my son. Look, I love him. Jesus never said, he's so cringy. <laughs> he accepted it. And that's what we want to build in our families that sense of being belonging. We are deeply loved. This morning, God says, you are deeply loved, my friends. You are deeply, deeply. Deep. This is the God who loves you so much. He exchanged his son's life for you, for us. This is our God. That's why under tremendous pressure, we know he loves us. And that makes all the difference. Number one, to embrace God's worth of a person, to be embraced by his love. Secondly, is to embrace the work God has for a person. What do I mean by that? Again, DPM, uh, quoting him because he made some good statements. I do not intend, yeah, but let, let's have a look at what he says. He says, we also need to change our mindsets about what we consider success in life. Oh, this is, 
our leader in Singapore saying that it's good to have a culture in Singapore that values hard work and excellence and encourages everyone to aspire and strive to be better. But we should not be unwittingly drawn into a rat race of hyper-competition and endless comparisons with one another just to get ahead of others and to end up worse as a society. Basically, what he's saying is that our markers of success must be different. And I agree with him. Our markers of success must be different because it cannot be just comparison with others materially. But what is this marker, is it? How do we know we are in the correct space for success? Also, listen to this uh, comment by Janelle Ganesh. Janelle Ganesh, I think, is associate editor in uh, Financial Times in the UK. And in an 11th April published in Straits Times, article entitled, Success Has a Price, here's the bill. This is what he says. He says the evidence is strong, if not quite conclusive, that smartphones damage children, and girls in particular. Government should enact at least some legal curbs proposed in social psychologist Jonathan Hadid's book, The Anxious Generation. But take a moment to savour this secular miracle here. The smartphone panic exists because we, we are advanced enough to have invented such a device, rich enough that most people can afford one, and above all, so insulated from life and death issues that sad teenagers are what pass for news. Screen addiction is a disease, but a disease of success. It's a short article worth a short read, but basically, if I'm not wrong, I summarize it, he's basically saying we are victims of our own success. See, because the world works on this idea that success is measurable in financial and material terms, and therefore, as we reach there, we've got nothing else to go for. We get bored. He doesn't use that word. I'm using that word. We get bored with life. Life becomes meaningless. There's nothing else to do because all these entertainment, all these stuff uh, don't fill our soul. In the words of Henry Thoreau, the mass of men, and I would add women, lead lives of quiet desperation because life has become meaningless. We have achieved inverted commas success, but we are paying the price for it because it doesn't satisfy. What is meaning. You know, we, we had that research that shows that one quarter of Singaporean young adults struggle with mental health stress issues. I think a lot of it has to do with the sense that we don't have purpose and meaning in life. Wake, work, sleep, repeat. Wake, work, sleep, repeat. <laughs> it's an endless cycle, endless cycle, endless cycle. So many of us feel we are caught in this and because there's no purpose and meaning in life. Let me share with you what Jesus says. Huh? Again, today we focus on the life of Jesus. Matthew eleven twenty eight. 28. This is what the Lord says. Matthew 20, 11, 28. Come to me all who labor and are heavy laden. I pause a moment and say, that's what many of us feel, especially in your studies and your work. It's a, it's a heavy load upon you and upon your heart. And I will give you rest. Wow, it says, Verse 29, I will bring you on a Bahamas cruise and put you by the beach and let you sip pina colada all the days of your life. Sorry, that's a wrong Bible. <laughs> it's not what it says, isn't it? It says, take my yoke upon you. Huh? <laughs> you mean, I thought rest means, you know, relax. We throw off the yoke and just, you know, relax, isn't it? No. Take my yoke. Take my yoke upon you. What kind of Christianity is this? And learn from me, for I'm gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. That is wholeness, my friends. That is what it means to follow Jesus. We find that restedness. Now, the question, therefore, before us is, what is the yoke of Jesus? The yoke that Jesus has is an implement. It's a farming implement placed over a beast of burden, uh, usually a bullock that will move according to the will of the person driving it, which is the farmer, to plow the land. So that yoke symbolizes the weight, the burden that Jesus carries. And there's only one weight that Jesus carries, only one burden that Jesus carries. That is the will of God. My food is to do the will of my Father and to complete it. Only one thing satisfies the heart of Jesus. That yoke is the will of God. What this means is this, if you and I want to find true rest, true wholeness, we need to align ourselves to God's work in our life. There's no other way that you and I will find peace. Now, some of you are thinking, you mean I'm supposed to get into God's will? Ah? 
Yeah, of course. But you will say, but pastor, I'm afraid. Leh. I'm also afraid. Ah. <laughs> because you think, if I get into God's will, I'm in the center of His will, God may ask me to be a missionary to the slums of Calcutta. Allow me to share something candidly. Please don't take offense. Allow me to share something candidly in local, colloquial terms. Oh God, you know, I'm afraid to be in your will because if I'm, if I'm in your will, you will call me to be a missionary to, Cal- to the slums of Calcutta. So let me reply candidly in local, colloquial terms. Uh. Don't look yourself too up. Uh. <laughs> Translated, it means don't think too highly of yourself. Uh. When you surrender yourself to God's will, uh, God may say, you are not fit to be a missionary for me in Calcutta, slums of Calcutta. That's number one. So I'm being candid with all of us. Number two, number two, there's no other way we can find rest until you and I move ourselves into the will of God and to do His work. There's no other way. There's no other way. You can try it. The reason why many of us are laboring and are heavy laden is because we are trying other yokes. Uh. We are trying our own yokes uh, to be happy. We're trying our own yokes to find joy and meaning in this life. And I tell you, apart from the yoke of God, the yoke of Christ, you will struggle all the days of your life. God invites you today. You must be embraced by His love. But on our side, we must embrace all that God has given to us, His work for us. When you do so, you know what happens? It doesn't mean you have no trouble in your life, you know. What it means that in the midst of all that you do, when you embrace the will of God, you know what you're embracing? You're actually embracing God Himself because God is right there with you in His will. What does it mean to be in the will of God? Except the presence of God, isn't it? What is the will of God? The will of God is the presence of God in our lives. And if God is present with you, what pressures are there that you are, we are unable to take? God will enable us. Embracing wholeness means we embrace the worth of a person to be embraced by God. It means embracing the work that God has for us because He's there present with us. But one final thing, it means also we embrace the way of God for us as a person. So let me share with you by way of illustration concerning this whole idea of addictions. Addiction is a growing thing, addiction to our media devices and stuff like that. It's a growing thing in this world. So let me talk a little bit about addiction. Uh, Many of us, we have this mental model of addiction that addiction is due to chemical uh, hooks or chemical dependency in our lives. So when we think of alcohol, alcohol dependence, we think of nicotine, nicotine dependence, something very sensitive to my coffee, coffee dependence. (laughs) That's me, I'm a coffee addict. Uh, No, actually, I just love coffee. Uh, uh, (laughs) Drugs, drugs, okay, let's change topic. Opioids, (laughs) Opioids, <laughs> you know, uh, narcotics, you know. Many of us are addicted to different things. And, and we think it's because of these chemical hooks in our life. We don't have it, you know, the, the chemicals will make us feel we, we need to do it. And all this thought actually comes from a series of experiments done in the 1970s where they put rats, uh, individual rats, in cages. And they gave them two bottles of water, one with water, one is water laced with opioids and narcotics. And consistently, the rats will take the bottle with the opioids and narcotics. They'll take it so much that they overdose and die. And so, you see, they say, other oh, studies show that you know, chemical dependency, sure die one like that. Okay? And so this idea of chemical dependency came about. So I'm not saying it's not true. There is some part to it, but there's something more. Dr. Bruce Alexander came along. He looked at these studies, and he said, what if it's more than just chemical dependency? Are there other factors at play? And so he decided that he think that it's more than that, that there are contextual circumstantial factors that affect these rats. So he created a study uh, and he designed what is called Rat Park, P-A-R-K, Rat Park. And in Rat Park, it's not one rat, it's many rats. They can live in society. They've got many tunnels, they've got many toys, they're full of food in this Rat Park. And actually, it's Rat Paradise. Lah. Anything they want is given to them. And they got these two bottles of water there as well. So you can Google Red Park, Bruce Alexander, after service, after service. And, and, and put these two bottles of water down there and let them come and see which bottle of water they'll take. Consistently, the rats avoided that bottle laced with narcotics and opioids. Consistently, they took the one, just the pure water alone. 
Occasionally, rats intermittently came for this other one, but occasionally only, and never overdose, never overdose. Do you know what they discovered? The reason why in the first situation the rats did that uh, is because there's a deep need in their life that cannot be met. They need to be social creatures, but they are stuck, isolated, and the only way to cope with that is to take this opioid. But the moment you give them community, you give them meaning, you give them other things in this life, they don't want that, you know. It's incredible. The way to deal with drugs is community, not isolation. Interesting, isn't it? I share that with us because we are communal creatures. God created us in community. And if we are isolated, the reason why there is this growth of addictions in gaming, in, in alcohol, and so many things in this world, they are coping. We are coping with a pain. And a lot of it has to do with socially. We are socially not in a group. We are socially isolated. We feel alone. And I want to encourage you. Pastor Sharon preached a very good sermon two weeks ago. If you've not heard that about community and loneliness, please go and listen to that. But this morning, I want to share with you that this is important for us to understand. We are created for community and by ourselves, just our identity and by our working for God is not sufficient to create wholeness because we are created for community as well. You think with me, for Jesus himself, uh, when Jesus came on this earth, what was his task? Again, you all know it is to go to the cross, right? Substitutionary atonement, we all know that. How could he have done that? He could have done that by coming, baptized, and then after that, whole multiple seminars, whole multiple conferences, train a few of his guys to go and preach the gospel, and then at the cross, die on the cross for everyone, and he would still have accomplished the purposes of God, right? He didn't need anybody else. But was that what he did? No, you, you look at what it says in Mark chapter 3. It says he appointed 12 that he might send them out to preach and have authority to cast out demons. That's again not in the text, right? He could have done that. He could have just trained people, send them out. That's it. But the first thing that Mark includes in the text is this. He appointed 12 whom he also named apostles so that they might be with him. It boggles your mind. Here is God incarnate in the person of the Son. He needs human community. If he needs human community, what more you and I? Now, some of you will say, well, maybe Jesus knows uh, that these poor disciples of his uh, cannot make it. Uh, so he just needs to spend time with them. That may be true, but I share with you that actually Jesus, it is written for us that Jesus also needed his disciples. Again, in the Garden of Gethsemane, in Matthew 26, this is what it says. In his moment of greatest need, and taking with him Peter and his two sons, Zebedee, he began to be very sorrowful and troubled, and he said to them, my soul is very sorrowful, even to death. Remain here and watch with me. Jesus needed. He needed that community. See, friends, wholeness, as a person, you cannot be whole alone. Full stop. We can only be whole in community. That's why right in the beginning, God says, it is not good for man, stroke mankind, to be alone. We are created for community. You cannot find peace. You cannot find that wholeness or that resilience to bear under pressure alone. You need community. That's why we have the church here. That's why we have the church here. You know, what can we do? What can we do as a community to help one another be stronger, be whole, be more whole? Many of you here, you are students, you are young adults here and, and different ones, and you say, I'm only an individual. What can I do? What can I do to contribute to that community? So let me share with you a real story. Uh, I just happen to, I, I do know this to be true, and this one I shared with permission. A 15-year-old covenanter, I won't mention name, but when she was studying, she discovered that one of her classmates started dropping out in school. And out of concern, she went to see her teacher and found out that the friend was suffering from depression. And instead of stigmatizing the friend, instead of saying, oh, you lousy person, you're so weak, she felt compassion. She felt compassion for this person. And so she gathered the Christian classmates together and said, what can we do? What can we do? And this is what they did. They started praying for this friend. And they took turns uh, every day in the week. Someone would text her just to keep tabs with her. Hey, how are you? 
stuff like that. What's up? And they did this for a long, long, long time. These are not professionals. These are not you know, specialists. These are secretary students who loved and cared for someone. That's all they did. And you know what? It's incredible. This person have now turned a corner. If you see this person, the person in need, now you wouldn't know who the person is. Because, uh, of course, the medication helped. Uh, but I want to share with you, I think the community helped even more. Because she was embraced by a community of friends who accepted her and loved her as God would love her. That's what we are supposed to be. That's how we can help each other to be whole. You know, last year, a family was in need here. We shared concerning a, a run situation. This morning, he was in service. Uh, and many of you prayed. Many of you did incredible things to support the family. And the good news I want to share with you, uh, this week, just this Monday, Ryan has gone back to school. Let's thank God for that. It's incredible. It's incredible. Finally, he's well enough. Go back to school. Praise God. But I, I tell you what is even greater. This week, another covenantal family was in trouble. The son had emergency surgery uh, for a, 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 emergency surgery. But the child was scared. The child was afraid. Nine years old, needed emergency surgery. Anyone of us requiring surgery, I think we will be scared. Huh? Nine years old. Okay. Pastor Sandra visited this person and, and as she was going to the ward, she felt led by the Spirit. Hey, I can pray for her, but why don't I get Ryan to pray? Why Ryan has gone through so more, more surgeries than I think many of us here combined. She said, why don't we get asked? So she asked, hey, Ryan, this is the situation. Do you mind praying for this uh, titi? You know? Ryan is uh, 16 now. This boy is four years old, 14 years old, uh, 9 years old. So pray for this titi. And Ryan said, sure. So in the ward, this fearful young man, nine years old, switched on to the video and says, hey, hi, this, these are the first words out of Ryan's mouth. Hey, trust God. He's with you. Whenever you feel scared, play some worship songs to remember that his presence is with you. You know, when Pastor Sen and the mother heard that, they both started to tear because it was as if God was speaking to this young man through this wounded healer. Through Ryan, who had gone through so much pain, God was transforming that pain and using it to turn somebody to help another journey with Jesus. This is what it means for us as a community. All of us are broken people. All of us are wounded. But all of us can play a simple role to move someone along in that journey to follow Jesus. That is how we become whole together, what we embrace one another together. Men and women, this morning, this is what God gives to us. He says, I love you very much. Embrace your identity in me. But I've got a task for you as well. Embrace that task, that work that I have for you. But more importantly, God's inviting us to embrace one another so that we can be whole together. As we come to a close uh, this morning, often when we think about the mission of Jesus, we think of it as the cross, right or wrong? Right, yeah? Right, church, huh? right? <laughs> the cross. Must be the cross, isn't it? But I want to give you a description of what Jesus himself calls to be the cross. So for us, it's the cross. It's a catchphrase to throw everything inside there. Lah. But what did Jesus understand by the cross? What was his picture of the cross? I give you that picture this morning. This is Jesus' words himself. It's found in Luke chapter 4 at the beginning. of After baptism, this is his first message. And the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. Unrolling it, he found a place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the captives, recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And then he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendants, sat down. All eyes on the synagogue was fastened on him. He began by saying to them, Today, 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 this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. What is the mission of Jesus? If you ask Jesus, what is the mission of Jesus? It is the cross, but he describes it this way. It's proclaimed good news to those who are poor. Those of us who are poor in spirit, we are struggling. Jesus says, I proclaim to you the gospel. Freedom to those who are prisoners. Many of us, we are, bond we are in bondage to fear. God says, freedom to you. 
Many of you say, I, I can't see, Lord, I can't see. And God says, recovery of sight to the blind for you today to set the oppressed free because when Jesus has come, this is the year of the Lord's favour. Now is his time of favour for all who would believe. Let us pray. Let us pray. Father, we come before you in a broken world. We are broken people. We struggle. We struggle like David. We struggle like the psalmist in our best times. And we feel this weight and this pressure over us. And we come and we recognise this is normal. This is normal. It's okay to feel that. But more than just being normal, you ask us to be whole. To be whole. Because that is the vision of the cross. That is what Jesus came to do to set us free, free to be embraced by you, free to embrace your work in our lives, free to embrace one another, free to come out of our prisons of fear and all our petty longings, to surrender afresh to the will of our loving God. Thank you so much, Lord Jesus. This is our God who has come to set us free. Thank you, Lord. This morning, I want to give opportunity for different ones of us to respond. There are three groups here. There are three groups here, at least. The first, uh, with no eyes looking around, all heads bowed. Some of you say, God, I, I, I want to experience afresh what it means to be your son and daughter. I, I, I want that fresh touch from you. I, I need to embrace, to be embraced by you. Would you just say, God, God, I want to be embraced by you afresh. Would you embrace me? Would you embrace me? Would you embrace me afresh, dear Lord? For those of you who pray that prayer, I'd like to pray for you. With no one looking around, would you just raise your right hand and up and down? Just up and down. That's right, up and down. Right, right. That's right, up and down. Up and down. Father, you see all these hands online also, but you answer the prayers of these ones that they will experience you afresh this morning, dear Jesus. That they are your sons. They're your daughters. You love them very much. You are so proud of them. Really, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Secondly, I want to pray for those who struggle with being in God's will and you're afraid. But this morning, God says He wants to give us rest. And the best place in the world is the presence, His presence in your life. And you find that when you surrender to His will. And you say, Lord, this morning, I surrender to your will. I surrender to your will. Thank you, Lord. I surrender to your will, Lord Jesus. And again, I want to pray for you. If you pray that prayer, no one looking around, could you just raise your right hand and put it down? That's right, right hand, that's right. Right across the sanctuary, right hand and put it down. That's all, that's all. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Father, would you answer the prayers of these as well? Fulfill your will in every one of these lives that they may know rest is not just possible. Rest is real here and now let your presence be manifest to them. Finally, I want to pray for many of us here, many of us, because it takes all of us to be that full person, to experience that wholeness that God intends. We are made together. I pray, dear Jesus, that you would do so. And if that is what you say, Lord, I want to build this community. I I want to be part of that healing. I'm wounded, I'm broken, but I want to together build that community. Use me, Lord. Use me as you use so many people to bring that wholeness in this community. Use me, Lord, to bring that wholeness in this community. If that's your prayer, would you likewise raise your right hand and put it down? Raise your right hand and put it down. That's right, right hand. And thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Right across, right across. So many, so many. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Father, we come present to you our lives. For this is what Jesus says, the Spirit of the Sovereign Lord is on me. He has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom to the prisoners, recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favour. Do so, Lord. Do so, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. And everyone says, Amen. Let's all rise. Let's all rise as we close this song.
praise for indeed he has set us free thank you lord thank you lord and now would you lift your hands as you receive the benediction for this morning this morning's benediction comes from philippians 4 6 to 7. my dear brothers and sisters do not be anxious about anything but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving let your request be made known to God and the peace of God which surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus in Jesus name I pray service is over the lord bless you have a blessed week jeez for those of you who desire more help with anything related to mental health on the screen right now you will see two qr codes you can scan the QR code to, to connect with our CIC Care and Covenant team that will connect you and journey along with you and provide you the right resources um, if you are looking for help for your CG in equipping those who have um, mental health needs. Thank you so much for paying attention. Have a blessed week. For those of you who need prayer, the pastors and altar ministers are here to pray for you. See you next week.